Thank you everybody for joining us. This is the second year of our monthly webinar series. Today, we are going to have a wonderful presentation on origins and destinations, the rise of rewilding and its role with ecosystem restoration by Steve Car Carver and Ian Convery, co-chairs of the IUCN CEM Rewilding Task Force, and we're very happy to have them with us here today. So without further ado, I will pass this on to Steve and Ian, and I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brock. Um, yes, as the title suggests, this is looking at uh, the origins of rewilding, this idea of rewilding. Perhaps uh, towards the end of the presentation, Ian and I will give you some signposts as to perhaps where it's headed. Those of you who are up to date with the rewilding uh, uh, ecosystem restoration literature will know there's been some controversial uh, papers arguing either side of the coin, suggesting that perhaps rewilding is part of restoration or perhaps rewilding is something different. So we will, uh, we will dig into that towards the, uh, uh, the end of, uh, of this presentation. And the sharp eyes among you will have noticed there's a survey link there. Um, so this is a small survey monkey uh, survey. Uh, which we would ask all of you to to fill in, uh, but towards the end of our presentation, we have some some questions there. So, just uh, introduce myself. I'm Steve Carver. I'm the guy with the wild T-shirt on uh, in the bottom there, and the beard, or the beard's gone at the moment. So, if we were on video, you'd see clean shaven. Um, and uh, my colleague Ian. So, Ian, over to you. Yep. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ian Carver. I'm the guy in the the rather fetching hat there. Um, and I'm Professor of Environment and Society at the University of Cumbria. Okay, thank you. So, uh, rewilding, also known as, uh, you know, say, rewilding, ecological restoration. It's a kind of a double act, perhaps. Um, and uh, and, and, and our, uh, Ian and I, potentially in this instance, a double act as well. I'm not too sure about the, guy, the, the, the little ladies on, on the left, but perhaps where the guys in the middle are, Laurel you and Hardy. You obviously haven't got teenage girls, Steve, because that's <laughs> the reference to No, I don't. I have sons, yes. So, uh, more akin, more familiar with the guys in the middle. So anyway, we're a double act for today, so please bear with us as we swap uh, in between the, uh, the voices that you hear presenting these slides. So if we look at the origins of rewilding, the first time the word actually appeared in print uh, was in 1990, as to the best of our knowledge. This is as, a, as, as far back as we've been able to go, and it was Jennifer Foote. Uh, in an article for Newsweek magazine, which was entitled Trying to Take Back the World, you know, so and it was uh, uh, addressing this issue of, you know, can we turn the clock back in terms of uh, uh, restoring uh, natural habitats? Uh, Dave Farman was one of the first exponents of uh, rewilding, and he mentions it in Wild Earth magazine in his uh, series of articles titled Around the Campfire. So these are discursive articles discussing options, possibilities, etc. And then you see it occurring in what's arguably the first seminal paper uh, in the published literature on, on, on this, so 1998. Uh, Michael Soule and, and, and Reid Noss published uh, uh, their article on rewilding and biodiversity again in, in, in Wild Earth. Uh, Dave Farman goes forward in, in, in the noughties to uh, write uh, his book, uh, Rewilding North America, A Vision for Conservation, 21st Century. And if, from uh, uh, Michael and Reid's Reed's paper, we, we see uh, the original three C's uh, model, the cars, corridors and carnivores model. And we've got some more slides on that in a minute, but uh, this is where uh, a lot of the ecological uh, basis for, 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 for rewilding really comes in, this idea that uh, you need large uh, intact cores connected by rewilded corridors to give uh, keystone species such as carnivores freedom to roam. And since then we've seen uh, a, uh, various definitions and approaches for rewilding developing uh, since these, these early papers and, and, and books and, and ideas. It's now got a global reach. It's certainly captured public imagination in that it's no longer just 
um, a topic for discussion amongst academics and practitioners. It's this rewilding is a concept which has been discussed in in in, in daily newspapers, uh, in uh, uh, columns discussing environmental themes, um, and on TV and other media. And it's got a certain amount of celebrity status. I don't know what it's like around the rest of the world, but certainly in the UK, there are one or two celebrity individuals, uh, such as George Monbiot and, uh, uh, and, and Chris Packham and others, who are uh, leading the charge in terms of this, this, this new conservation idea. And you also see, and I've put it in inverted commas there, bandwagon conservation, this idea that uh, uh, existing conservation organizations, NGOs, government agencies, etc., have jumped on the rewilding bandwagon because they they see it as being having celebrity status. They see it as capturing the public imagination and say, oh, okay, we can have a bit of that. Uh, and some of it involves a rebadging of possibly a, a, of existing practice just under a new exciting sexy name. Um, but we do, through um, that process, see a dilution potentially of the basic ecological principles laid out in Sula Noss's paper in 1998 uh, and subsequent uh, writings, uh, what uh, rewilding is really all about. So that's just a little run through its, um, you know, its sort of literary and, and, and conceptual origins and where we are up to date. And of course, uh, we see the um, uh, the ecological underpinnings of uh, of rewilding as being this cause corridors and and, and carnivores model, um, as espoused by uh, Michael Soule and Reed North in the 1998 paper. Um, so, carnivores needing large areas to, for for habitat, for breeding, for hunting, etc., and the corridors linking linking them together for movement. And there are uh, a, a number of rewilding definitions and approaches, and this is a diagram borrowed from Nougas Bravo et al. 2016 uh, in Current Biology, where they're chewing at this, this, this problem of you know, rewilding. The title says it all, rewilding is the new Pandora's box in conservation. And so there are different approaches, uh, there are different themes within rewilding. So the, the Sule and Nos approach is this restoring big wilderness based on regulatory roles of large uh, uh, predators, the cars, corridors and carnivores model. Uh, and so that involves potentially, rewilding may potentially involve the reintroduction of predators to their former ranges where they've been made extinct, hunted to uh, extinction or their habitat has been lost uh, in their former ranges. In 2005, we see an interesting paper by Donlan et al, which is Pleistocene rewilding, which aims to restore evolutionary and ecological potential of 13,000 years ago. So, and of course, a lot of those taxa, those species, have been are extinct now. So, the woolly rhino, the woolly mammoth, etc. So, talking about reintroducing uh, uh, their functional equivalents of extinct taxa. Um, now they used the plains of North America as their as their thought piece in that uh, in that paper, and uh, I think we can probably say that although this is at the landscape scale, this is big scale stuff um, uh, with interesting uh, taxa functional equivalents, which might make that practically impossible in a landscape like the North American plains. Of course, there is an example in uh, northern Siberia where people are talking about uh, reintroducing functional equivalent of lost species up there, uh, which may, given the landscape, may well be possible. But in Europe, what we tend to see is we tend to see these two at the, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse waving around, um, but we, um, we tend to be looking at rewilding from a, a passive or an active uh, uh, dichotomy if you like. So passive rewilding is about uh, uh, ecological succession when humans uh, vacate certain landscapes. So in Europe there is uh, large-scale land abandonment in certain areas, southern Europe and uh, the Mediterranean and in uh, eastern Europe where landscapes are no longer profitable to farm. Um, and so that's you know what we call land abandonment. The translocation rewilding 
is about active rewilding. It's about stepping in and making changes to uh, landscapes which seek to restore missing or dysfunctional ecological processes. So, for example, through the reintroduction of large herbivores. So whereas this is a non-intervention process through passive rewilding, this is a conservation grazing approach, a managed rewilding approach, usually behind fences um, and in a controlled landscape. And of course, there's another, uh, uh, um, another string to the bow of rewilding, if you like, in that uh, we can think about the uh, psychological aspects of rewilding self. Uh, I've termed certain uh, projects which involve more extensive farming um, to allow more biodiverse farmed landscapes to develop as rewilding light because they are certainly not at this end of the spectrum in terms of reintroducing predators, and they're not about land abandonment. They're not really about conservation grazing, although they, uh, they're still farmed landscapes. We might also think about rewilding urban areas, small scale. Uh, there have been uh, claims of eco-colonialism leveled at uh, uh, certain groups wanting to uh, impose rewilding principles in other areas. And there's a, no a notion of rewilding by design or wild by design that came out of a, a review of uh, the national parks in England a few years ago, uh, where it's about re designing uh, wild into the landscape. And of course, Dolly Organson in her paper, Rethinking Rewilding, refers to rewilding as a plastic term as a result of all of these different flavors. Um, I then respond uh, uh, to some of these claims by talking about real wilding um, in terms of not talking about conservation grazing and perhaps not talking uh, about managed rewilding within fences but allowing non-intervention land abandonment nature to take uh, its course. And at that point I'll hand over to Ian. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so why, why are we talking about rewilding? Um, this will be a familiar story to, to many of you, but I think nevertheless it's still worth running through uh, some of this stuff quickly. Um, we know from a huge body of evidence collected over the last 30 years or so that biodiversity is in trouble. Um, we know that fortress conservation isn't working. Um, so over the last 100 years or so, um, since the first national park, Yellowstone, in 1872, we've seen a big increase in the number of protected areas globally, but this hasn't halted biodiversity loss. What we've ended up with are islands of protection in a, essentially a sea of, of human-dominated land use. Um, the world, of course, looks very different in 2020 to how it did in 1872. Uh, we know about the species ex extinction crisis uh, through various reports, WWF is in Planet Report 2018, um, IPPS report in 2019. Uh, so the Living Planet Index measuring um, uh, change in a range of indicator species uh, over the period 1970 to 2010 um, uh, indicates there's about 60% decline in, in the indicated species across terrestrial, marine and freshwater environments. IPBS uh, came out in 2019, talked about 1 million species facing extinction over uh, the next few decades. Many species aren't covered by protected areas. So uh, this is a slide which looks at um, Kenya um, and national parks and protected areas in Kenya. It's a little bit outdated, it's from, from the 1990s, but nevertheless, it reflects a pattern which is, is, is still true more or less globally. Um, uh, much of the wildlife is, of course, outside of protected areas. Uh, with, with this example from Kenya, about 65% of the wildlife is outside of, of any kind of protection. Uh, so in, in the Kenyan context, that's wildlife that's moving between protected areas, trampling crops and going through villages and everything else. And even within protected areas, and you know, other ecosystems continue to degrade um, because many protected areas aren't big enough or connected enough to allow for fully functioning food webs and uh, trophic connections. And also the stack to boundaries of protected areas don't accommodate change or don't easily accommodate change. Um, so there's a need to rethink the conservation model uh, and we would argue that rewilding is complementary to protected areas, but also to uh, community conservation models. 
um, which have become much more prevalent over the last 20, 30 years. Of course, the key point and the, the point of interest for this afternoon is what is the relationship between wilding and ecological restoration. So this next slide, which I've nicked from Michael Sule, uh, I think neatly, neatly in, uh, encapsulates or explains the reasons for, uh, for most of the previous slides. I don't know how clearly that's showing on everybody's screens, but um, this looks at Earth's land mammals by weight. The dark gray is humans. The light gray is the kind of animals, uh, the mammals that we tolerate, so all our pets and livestock. And the green are, are wild, wild animals. Uh, and what that represents is, a, is, of course, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, the role of agriculture in, in, um, in biodiversity loss, everything that we've been talking through is kind of represented in that slide. Uh, and this message is, has of, of a kind of human dominated land use has been reinforced by a recent review paper by, uh, in science by Diaz et al, um, which again highlights the need for transformative change. Uh, so why is, why is all this stuff important? Well, we know from, from um, a, huge, a huge body of evidence that's looked at species interactions that populations are regulated in both a top-down and a, and a bottom-up way, and that regulation helps to, helps to put, um, protect against disturbance, but also creates ecosystems that are more robust and more resilient. And as Steve said at the, at the start of the talk, the role of carnivores is often uh, crucially important in terms of that ecosystem regulation. Um, uh, and, if we, and if we're losing species as a result of, um, of, of the lack of regulation, we of course end up with a downgrading of ecosystems and a loss of resilience within those ecosystems uh, and, and, and a corresponding loss of ecosystem services, which has a whole range of, of human implications as well. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, so, at that you know, having set the scene there in terms of the origins of rewilding and why it's important, and some of the uh, issues there that Ian's just talked about in terms of trophic downgrading and uh, loss of biodiversity, etc., and the effect of uh, human dominion over many of our ecosystems, uh, this is where we are today with uh, uh, setting up um, under the auspices of uh, CEM. Um, and the IUCN uh, a rewilding task force and we were asked uh, Ian and myself and a group a small group of others um, to uh, consult uh, an, an attempt to unite that's <laughs> talk about herding cats but try to unite scientists academics advocates practitioners and recreational experts working in the field of rewilding to create some common basis or common understanding to further develop and understand this idea uh, that we call rewilding, establish common ground uh, within the current ecosystem conservation initiatives. Um, and really to provide uh, the CEM with a clear understanding of what rewilding is about, its history, definitions, transitions and possible futures, uh, steering it uh, along those lines and to link that to CEM priority areas. But I think the critical thing here is, a, uh, is the, the expressed need for, for, for some clarity. Given that rewilding has its origins uh, and as an ecological principle of conservation uh, and has now uh, become a thing of many flavors, many colors, um, we need uh, some uh, clarity at this stage of exactly what we're talking about. So we as a, a, as a task force were established in late 2017. We've got a work plan for two years, which we're coming to the end of now. Uh, and the things that we've done, we've, had, we've, we've performed a, a reasonably large survey of rewilding pioneers. Uh, so these are people uh, who were uh, there at the beginning uh, uh, working on this, this new idea of rewilding. We've performed a systematic literature review and we've been working over the past year or so developing a set of guiding principles um, for rewilding, uh, working with a panel uh, of experts uh, and invitees to a series of uh, workshops at which we've tested these guiding principles in 2019 and 2020. Um, and we aim at the end of the day to be able to produce an IUCN concept note uh, on uh, and we've developed a, a, a continuum of rewilding uh, and hopefully end up using that to uh, support decisions about this, this topic in the future.
In terms of the survey of rewilding pioneers, uh, we identified a panel of practitioners and academics uh, who were representative, both organizationally, geographically, and philosophy. We contacted 126 individuals, for which we had uh, uh, 59 responses. Um, this uh, the survey recognizes that there are conceptual and practical differences uh, in uh, understandings of what rewilding is. So we had 26 questions, so it's quite a long survey. Um, but these are just some examples. We were asking people uh, what the circumstances, drivers were, which gave rise to the concept and their opinion. Uh, when, where, and how did they first hear about it? Uh, at what time, uh, at that time, what were their expectations for rewilding, uh, given that uh, it's, it's quite, quite a long gestation period now and their opinions may well have changed. Uh, what they considered to be the most uh, significant barriers to rewilding and where they saw the future for it. Uh, and from that, I don't expect you to read this. Um, it's in our, one of our reports, but it's, we've been able to develop a, a reasonably uh, detailed timeline. This was just for the early 90s, just for a, a slide to show you. So we've got this, this timeline. Uh, and if, if you can read that, you can probably see some of the key names in there, like John Turborg and, and uh, Reid Noss uh, and Michael Soule and, and others uh, talking about uh, what their views were at the time. Um, and we're moving forward now into developing a set of what we call our IGPs and uh, rewilding re guiding principles. Uh, following on from that pioneers questionnaire, we asked uh, uh, some uh, representative individuals, organizations to put down on paper uh, 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 their, uh, their own principles of rewilding, what they considered to the principles to be. Uh, now that included organisations like Rewilding Britain, Rewilding Europe, ZSL, that's the Zoological Society in London, the Rewilding Institute, and key individuals like Reid Noss, Mark Burkhoff, etc. Um, and from that set of uh, uh, stated principles, we were able to uh, filter through them, on basically a paper exercise saying, well, okay, one organization has written it this way, another organization has written it that way, but it essentially means the same thing. Uh, we've managed to uh, do a filter and sort process on, uh, and we came up with, I think, about 49 uh, different principles for rewilding. What we then did is filtered through those and tried to sort of express those diagrammatically. Um, and uh, in that process came up with this. Okay, it's not perfect and it's probably a bit too busy. Um, but the key things here, if we simplify that, um, is that we're talking about uh, a process uh, or a, a, uh, which is nature led, but human enabled. Um, sat around uh, some uh, um, this Venn diagram which shows cause, connectivity and coexistence. So it's similar to the cause, corridors and carnivores. It's a three C's model, but it's a, it's a, a subtly different three C's model. So we, we recognize the important role that core areas with fully occupied and fully functioning trophic ecosystems represent. So we might refer to those as wilderness areas or wild areas. <coughs> Excuse me. And we recognize that connectivity between those is important uh, as an ecological principle. So you see in the overlap, uh, the ecological principles, you know, of connectivity represented by migration between core areas. Um, but connectivity is not just about uh, cars, it's about landscape corridors as well, but it's also about people. And so this idea of coexistence on this side, coexistence with nature, wild nature, we see the rewilding self and the land sharing uh, in that overlap. In the overlap between cars, we need to recognize that we need ex effective air protection areas for protecting wilderness, wild cars, and that's a land sparing model. So this idea that we've got nature-led, human-enabled. And there's some broad concepts around the outside which underpin this, the notion of scale. There's different levels to rewilding. Things take time. And, you know, we're talking about uh, diversity here as well. So in our draft re rewilding guide and principles, our RPGs, um, that's unfortunate. 
acronym actually i'm just thinking that's rocket propelled grenade as well isn't it but never mind uh, maybe that's a grenade that's going to throw itself into the uh, conservation uh, um, uh, uh, profession but goal of rewilding is uh, we're saying here is the restoration so there's the restoration word i'm afraid uh, of functioning native ecosystems complete with fully occupied trophic levels that are nature led, in other words, nature's calling the shots across a range of landscape scales. So scale is there. Rewilded ecosystems should be self sustaining, requiring non or at least minimum intervention management. So, this uh, concept of natura naturans, you know, in other words, nature doing what nature does, that recognizes that these are dynamic systems and they're not static. And we say that rewilding principles should be consistent where appropriate with evolving principles um, and that uh, the standards for ecological restoration, nature-based solutions, the CBD approach, etc. should be uh, um, incorporated. Rewilding can be described as a process, rebuilding negative ecosystems following major human disturbance to create a complete food web at all trophic levels that's sustainable, it's resilient, and it uses biota that would have been present had that disturbance not occurred. Now that's a sort of those are broad kind of goals, aims, objectives type statements. Um, but the key points are about restoration of functioning native ecosystems, fully occupied trophic levels, species that would have been present had the disturbance not occurred, the self-sustaining and the dynamic and it's consistent with these approaches of ecological restoration, NBS, CBD, uh, and potentially natural capital, so linear ecosystem. And we've developed a set of 10 principles, and these are summarized from uh, a large document, so there's exp more expansive text on these, but basically what we're saying, that rule number one, we try to put these in a certain kind of order, which is logical, and you might argue that you could alter the order in which these come uh, and to some extent maybe the order is not important um, but uh, uh, rewilding uh, utilizes wildlife to store restore trophic interactions so this might include introductions reintroductions population reinforcement of apex predators keystone species rewilding should employ landscape scale planning that includes core areas connectivity and coexistence and we've talked about that in that simple venn diagram model already uh, rewilding requires local engagement and support so we kind of then coming back to some of these more community-based issues it needs to be inclusive with local consultation and participatory planning so we've seen recently in the uk a, 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 a large sort of flagship a rewilding project uh, stumble and fail at one of the early starting blocks simply because they weren't inclusive and didn't have enough participatory local co uh, consultation. So we, it needs to encourage public understanding of wild nature and address people's concerns about coexistence, perhaps with large carnivores and other animals. Rewilding focuses on uh, the recovery of ecological processes, interactions, conditions based on reference ecosystems. So whereas it might not be talking about necessarily going back in time to previous conditions rather than going forward in the future, it does need some kind of reference. So using appropriate ecological references based on contemporary reference areas or models based on historical records where these don't exist. Uh, and potentially using indigenous and local knowledge as, uh, to build, uh, bolster or, or support the science, scientific evidence. Five, you know, rewilding recognizes that they're dynamic, ecosystems are dynamic and constantly changing. Therefore, space is required, connectivity is required uh, to allow uh, the temporal change of processes. And here we talk about allergenic and autogenic uh, um, uh, forcing. So storms, floods, et cetera, or internal nucleant uh, uh, cycles, energy flows, et cetera. Rewilding should anticipate the impact of climate change. So we, we had an, you know, discussion about this early on. Uh, do we really need to consider about climate change? Well, I think you know, uh, evidence uh, is growing that uh, you know, we are uh, approaching certain tipping points here. So climate change does need to be taken into account. And of course, rewilding can be considered a nature-based solution in helping to potentially mitigate against some of the effects of climate change.
rewilding is informed by science, but again, you know, considers indigenous local knowledge. So practicing and research, indigenous local collaborations are an important element in developing adaptive management frameworks. And rewilding recognizes the intrinsic value of all species. I think there's an ethical responsibility for the existence of all species. So it is uh, at this eco uh, ecological level, it's a, a biocentric rather than an anthropocentric approach. And the last two here, rewilding is adaptive. It's dependent on, uh, on monitoring and feedback. So monitoring in any, any uh, ecosystem restoration style project will do, uh, provide evidence of short and medium term results. Um, it'll help us determine whether the uh, foreseen or the, the predicted rewilding trajectories are working as planned. And there's a role there for participating volunteer based information in, in collecting that data. And then this last one, and it's kind of an interesting one. It could be, it could be a goal, it could be a name, it could go right at the front, but uh, at the moment it's here at number 10 at the end there, which says rewilding. And I think this is really important. I think rewilding prevent, provides us with an opportunity for a paradigm shift in the coexistence of humans and nature. And so here we're, we're concerned about the awareness of the importance of global ecosystems for all life on the planet. And we need to recognize that there's a shift in ecological baselines, although there needs to be a shift in ecological baselines to healthy, fully functioning trophic ecosystems, instead of accepting you know, a succession of degraded ecosystems and overexploitation as the norm. And, you know, for a long time, I've been working on wilderness mapping and things based on this human modification spectrum with increasing anthropogenic mod modification to the left, increasing ecological integrity and quality towards the right. And where does rewilding sit within that? So we've got rewilding ambition here, uh, largely in this, in this, in this area um on this this continuum but if we think about where you know addressing this issue again about where does ecological restoration and rewilding overlap then it's probably in this area here at the bottom so you know if we're thinking about urban landscapes and putting a bit of nature back into urban landscapes you know maybe that's remediation uh into agri landscapes that's maybe rehabilitation and then ecological restoration starts to kick in here. Uh, and, and then there's some overlap with this rewilding. And I think the natural goal of rewilding is to create secondary wilderness. You're never going to get back to the original wilderness uh, condition, but uh, hopefully rewilding takes us uh, uh, along that route towards wilderness areas. So that's the real interesting bit. Anyway, over to Ian again. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, so, uh, I, in a, a few slides ago, I talked about the importance of the spaces in between protected areas and, and, and species that are outside of those kind of core protected areas. And Steve's just been talking about the, uh, the continuum model. And in this slide, which I've borrowed from, from Mark Fisher in a recent paper in ECOS, um, Mark looks at this uh, uh, at this from a slightly different perspective, um, uh, but again, kind of highlights the need for connectivity and, and for coexistence across, across the landscape and for a, a matrix approach essentially to how we develop uh, models for land use. Um, so I'm, uh, just click on Steve, it should bring up some graphs. Mm. They're too small for you to read. Um, uh, but what, uh, what, this, what this is showing is that in a UK context, certainly, um, post-Brexit and post um, the, the common agricultural policy, we're starting to rethink uh, issues around land use and land use change and, and, and that relationship between um, broadly agriculture and, and conservation. Um, and all the signs are that we're starting to move away from uh, output oriented agriculture towards an approach which is predicated more on ecosystem goods and services. Um, and in theory, at least, offering a more joined up approach to land use planning, because those spaces in between the core areas and how we manage them and how we pro provide connectivity uh, for species are absolutely vital to, to this debate and also for rewilding. And get at the heart of why the protected area system is in crisis. Uh, so onto onto the um, main theme of today, actually, um, or eventually. Um, uh, I did have a joke here about divergent and covergent uh, evolution, but I decided it was way too nerdy, really, for <laughs> so I dropped it. Um, 
But I guess the question is, are, are our evolutionary paths uh, as rewilders or, or ecological restoration professionals uh, now converging or, or diverging? Uh, and it's perhaps useful to step back in time a little bit and think about the histories of restoration and rewilding, which I would argue that whilst we've got a lot in common, we do come from slightly different places with ecological restoration, perhaps more rooted in ecology, and rewilding certainly rooted in conservation biology and conservation science, uh, with a more transdisciplinary approach, bringing in more of the social sciences and, and, and political sciences into, into conservation and rewilding practice. Um, skip on, Steve. Um, and this, this debate about uh, the relationship between rewilding and ecological restoration has started to play out in the academic literature. So at the start of the session, Steve talked about um, some, some recent papers. Um, he's referring to a paper by uh, uh, Matt Haywood, which came out in 2018, which essentially suggested that rewilding is simply um, ecological restoration dressed up differently. Uh, now, I would disagree with that, and many in the rewilding community would disagree with that. There was a response to this paper by Anderson et al., which uh, came out last year and highlighted that whilst all rewilding is restoration, not all restoration is rewilding. And they focused on, economy, on the autonomy of ecological process and what they call a controlled decontrolling. Um, of human agency in relation to managing landscapes or not managing landscapes as the case may be. Now I think this is helpful, um, but I think uh, I would also challenge whether all rewilding is uh, ecological restoration. So again, just to step back a bit further, Steve, if, we, if we look at some of the early uh, concepts or definitions of, of both restoration and uh, rewilding, I've taken this from uh, 1995 um, uh, and, and then again from 2004 and, and SER. And a definition of or conceptualize, conceptualization of restoration as being the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. Skip on one, Steve, please. Um, and there's, there's, there's certainly um, uh, much, I think much of that definition is reflected in the first three bullet points of, of this conceptualization, which I've taken from rewilding earth, but there's very similar conceptualizations of rewilding on, on other rewilding orientated websites. Um, so I think uh, those first three bullet points, which talk about trophic interaction, uh, large cores, protected, large, the, the importance of large core areas to protect our landscapes and connectivity kind of relate very much back to that previous uh, definition of, of restoration. What perhaps is different um, is, is a focus as well with rewilding on, the, on eco-psychology and some of the deep ecology literature, uh, deep ecology literature rooted in the traditions of conservation biology, which I think offer a a slightly different perspective. Um, think what, what where this gets us to is uh, maybe a key difference uh, is that rewilding um, uh, actively promotes connectivity with without being cheesy um, the hearts and minds of people and, and, and is about rewilding the self um, and, as well as being about rewilding landscapes and in doing that and in, in, in embracing that idea of rewilding the self it draws on a different literature, um, a literature rooted in eco-psychology and deep green thinking. Um, and this idea of transformative ch change, which I know the IECN are embracing at the moment, uh, requires that, that holistic approach. Um, it, it needs to be ethical, emotional, but it also needs to be political, economic, scientific, uh, and knowledge focused in terms of how we engage with a whole range of different debates and challenges for conservation. So, as I mentioned before, there is a survey monkey link there. And so after I've just flipped through this few set of slides here and finishing off, um, you might have to uh, uh, think which of the following options, and there are uh, uh, five here, A, B, C, D, and E, 
uh, do you think best reflects the relationship between restoration and rewilding? And I've just simply represented these as Venn diagrams again. So we have the red one on the, <coughs> uh, on, the on the left there being restoration, and uh, and the, the 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 blue one on the on the right representing rewilding. And so this is a, a versus or a with type approach. So uh, without further ado, uh, do you think? Uh, that uh, the relationship is this it's an and relationship so restoration and rewilding uh, but what is that degree of overlap um, you know is it narrow or is it uh, or, or is it broad so there's option a uh, option b would suggest that actually that overlap is a lot larger um, and uh, you know the degree of, uh, of commonality between the two concepts here of ecological restoration re and rewilding is actually larger uh, than perhaps we thought. Uh, option C, well, actually, is rewilding just part of restoration? You know, is it something specific within the broader field of ecological restoration and sits uh, entirely within? Um, or is it, are, is it indeed that they're actually, you know, very different uh, uh, things? Uh, restoration on, on, on the left there and rewilding on the right and no overlap. So it's an or type relationship. Um, it's either or and not both. Or is in fact everything just restoration and rewilding doesn't really exist. It's just a, just a fad, a term, a, a, a bandwagon which people are jumping on because it's kind of new and sexy. So just to remind you, we've got... Uh, 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 five options there in that yeah there's a little bit of overlap you can see how the two might relate to each other um, that overlap is actually quite large that's option B um, uh, option C is rewilding sits entirely within restoration there's nothing different about rewilding it's just you know a, a specific uh, type of restoration uh, option D is they're actually completely different things uh, and there's no overlap whatsoever or indeed actually Rewilding doesn't exist at all. It's just a it's just a term, um, and so that's that's kind of why your options are. So just quickly again, you've got A, B, C, or D. And if you'd fill in our your at your leisure the uh, survey monkey form, that might uh, that might give us some idea of this uh, self-selected sample of people attending this uh, this this webinar. What you think? And I think just to, just to add to that, um, the, the, the questionnaire really occupies some kind of strange space between a bit of fun and the survey. So I think, it, 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 I think it's interesting and, and, and well, it'll be very interesting to see the results as they come through from that, but it's, it's, um, it's not a scientific survey. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll share the, re the results with you in due course. Yeah. So, you know, our last slide here, um, you know, is... Clearly, there's an ongoing discussion there, but uh, you know we we've seen diverging and converging concepts here between rewilding and or ecological restoration. Um, but I do think we need to avoid creating islands. Um, but the overlap, um, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I think there is overlap. Um, I'm not sure how to what degree it is yet. Um, but we would say, you know, going back to our original uh, cause, corridors and coexistence uh, Venn diagram, the three circles there, that rewilding is nature led, but human enabled. So in other words, nature is determining the trajectories and what's happening within the, the space. Um, but and we're just allowing that to happen whereas potentially and this is not a perfect model I stress uh, it's very strongly at this point restoration perhaps is more human-led it's us deciding what we're going to allow to happen whether it's a you know river restoration project or whatever as in the slide in the picture there but uh, the natural processes enable these things to happen. So there's a greater element of, of, uh, of control and design involved in the restoration process. Uh, the focus on in rewilding on animals as keystone species is perhaps a key. And so we see these two different three C's models, the original cars, corridors and carnivores underpinning the ecological idea, but this more sort of, uh, which Ian was talking about, the sort of eco psychology, type approach is bound up more in the cause corridors uh, connectivity and coexistence model stress on the coexistence there and uh, there's our closing thoughts so we i think uh, we're opening it up for more broader discussion now
I think we're open for questions and answers now. Um, we have had quite a few come in so far, and we'll try to get to them as best as we can. And I've been uh, tracking, this is Kara Nelson, co-chair of the Thematic Group, and I've been tracking all the questions and answers. So some of them have been a uh, discussion about some of the concepts that have been covered. So I'll read the whole discussion in those cases, and then you guys um, can provide your feedback and comments. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, first we have Zoltan Kun from Hungary, who's actually a member of the Rewilding Task Force. And he says, based on recent discussions on the IUCN motion about rewilding, there's one element missing, active rewilding, which some define as a way to keep up human influence. Giovanni, Ra oh, I'm going to uh, butcher this, Rabakuku. Um, says, you may well address this during the talk, but could you please talk a bit about the scope and objectives of the rewilding task force and how individuals and organizations can interact with it? Mike okay. Jones says, uh, Maybe it's easier just to skip back to, to the slide where um, Steve introduced the, the ends and objectives of the, um, okay. of the task force. Yeah, go ahead and answer that, and I'll I'll bin um, the comments about ideas about rewilding and restoration together. So, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so that's that that's why we were formed back in 2017. Obviously, rewilding had been on um, the radar of, of Sam. There was an interest in the concept and what the concept might mean for various activities within SAM. And we were asked to pull together a task force to, to address those issues. And as Steve said, when he introduced this, this slide to see if we could, um, could do the impossible and come up with a clear understanding and definition and, and knit everything together neatly. Um, so that's what we've been struggling with for the last couple of years. Um, the out, one of the outputs has been the, um, the RPGs, as, as Steve described. Uh, we're now looking to report back uh, our, our activities at uh, WCC 2020 in Marseille, and then also have discussions about what, uh, what the role of the task force is going forward. And of course, we are ready to, to, um, to collaborate and engage with anybody who's interested in rewilding and wants to talk to us. Yeah, I think the key thing there, the task force has been fairly tight in that we've uh, reached out to uh, um, early pioneers uh, for the Pioneer Survey. We've reached out to uh, a range of individuals to bring them together a, a series of workshops to discuss the rewilding principles and fine tune those, wordsmith them, uh, uh, etc. And we've got a number of sort of continental representatives around the globe, uh, but it's still a relatively tight group. Uh, going forward, we'd like to see the Rewilding Task Force become a thematic group within CEM, which then opens it up to uh, wider membership so people can apply to be a member of that group. Uh, and we, you know, have a, a certain role to play then in filtering that. But uh, basically, it's open to anybody who's interested in the topic. Uh, the topic thing. Great, thank you. And I'll add for those who are in North America and going to the Society for Conservation Biology meeting, there will be a workshop on rewilding and restoration, you're all invited to participate. And we'll be circulating the results of the discussions of that workshop through the Ecosystem Restoration uh, Okay, I have now organized, we only have nine or so minutes, seven minutes left. So uh, we have one question and then a series of comments related to the concepts of rewilding. So here's the question. How, and this is from Margaret Williams. How are the rewilding principles being integrated into city and regional planning? What are effective ways of convincing planning committees of committing to this in light of continued development? Well, the, the short answer is they're not yet um, because we're, we're, they're, they're, we're, I think we're just at the point now where we probably say that um, they're not draft anymore and we're ready to present them. But this is, 
this is the point at which we present them to, to SEM and the IACN. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're very keen that they travel as far as they can and they do have um, policy uh, impacts, um, but we're not at that stage yet. Uh, I don't know if you want to add to that, Steve. No, not at all. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a question of, uh, I guess, you know, if you're talking about city and regional planning, um, you know, to what extent that, uh, I mean, scale is very important here. Um, and so the need for uh, scaling up, uh, thinking about landscape scale processes, how city and regional planning can slot in some of the principles of rewilding to create, uh, you know, um, at a small scale, to, uh, across large scales, if you like, you know, everything building up in, um, you know, small stuff building up into large stuff. Um, but, you know, I might go back to Zoltan's question about active rewilding, you know, as a way to keep human influence. You know, this is one of the uh, criticisms against uh, conservation grazing has really just been farming under a different guise. It's more extensive and it's using you know native breeds or uh, uh, semi-domestic livestock as surrogates for free roaming uh, large herbivores but it is in some circles you know it's a half it's very much a halfway house and what I as I say I've referred to as in some of my publications as rewilding light um, and, but it does it limits uh, the uh, the scope of rewilding to uh, you know farming under a, in a slightly different way, um, and so I understand Zoltan's concerns there. And I think just to add to that, um, that it's it's about it's about trade offs and getting the balance right, isn't it? Because uh, not everywhere can be a core kind of conservation area, so the spaces in between are important. But there's also the opportunity cost of if we're Managing land, mm. as Steve's just indicated, and that that we could be managing that land differently. So it's always yeah. about just yeah. you know, conversations and looking at the best possible land use uh, that, that, that that we can. Yeah. So, what were some of those comments, Clara? Okay, so I'm gonna kind of pick through and generalize, and then you guys can um, perfect provide your perspectives on the chat debate about what is rewilding and how does it relate to restoration. So we had Mike Jones throwing in a comment about how it might be considered a nature-based solution. Um, we have, uh, if I am not wrong, is rewilding a more modern name of restoration? Uh, Toby asked, can you explain what seems to be conflicting concepts? Then Zoltan said, in my view, rewilding means more than restoration with the aspirational target of ending up with functioning ecosystems. Sean Stone says, does rewilding imply primarily the rewilding of large-bodied wildlife? If so, must rewilding be contingent upon a phased approach after the expansion of wildlife corridors in order to adapt to human modifications of the landscape? Um, I made a comment stating that um, the ecological restoration and rewilding have the aim, same endpoint, both aim to remove degradation, return the system to the condition it would have been in if degradation hadn't occurred. However, the community of people working on both are using different methods. And merging of the camps would be beneficial. Um, uh, Zoltan made a comment, there's one element which Steve and Ian have not yet covered, rewilding hearts and minds, which you actually then went on to cover. Um, Let's see, um, there, uh, Giovanni said, is the rewilding versus restoration debate useful for conservation in practice? Um, and uh, we have a few more, but I wanna give you time to comment. Um, so I think I'll stop there. There also were quite a lot of um, congratulations to you for a good presentation. Do you okay, have a thanks. minutes for final perspectives on this issue? I can't remember the first question. <laughs> it wasn't really a question. It was just people's ideas on the relationship between restoration and rewilding and yeah. um, whether you have any uh, final comments. Yeah. I think the, 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 the end point uh, one was, was interesting for me, this notion that as restoration and rewilding you know, have the, the same final end point, which is restoration restoring ecosystems i've said it, restoring uh or rewilding ecosystems to the uh, uh you know what they would have been without modification uh, i just wonder to what extent you know does 
ecological restoration stop at a certain point and and the true rewilding what i call real wilding with that al in the brackets there actually take us towards um uh, wilderness you know reinstatement of wilderness now i've had this argument with a number of people before who are rewilders according to their uh, their their websites who who say well no we're not about recreating wilderness you know we're about you know creating spaces for wild animals um, uh, for people to look at. <laughs> I have a great <laughs> suggested that? question to end on. How about this one yeah. um, from Giovanni? Is the rewilding versus restoration debate useful for conservation and practice? I would just, just add to Steve's last point as well, if I may. I wonder if the step, uh, the, the different step is that kind of control, decontrolling that, uh, that Anderson at all talk about. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is it, is it useful? Well, I think it, it, whether it's useful or not, it's out there, and people are talking about it and talking about the relationships between rewilding and restoration. So it's better just to address it and try to to explore those relationships and look at look at uh, how we can work together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fantastic. Right on the hour here. So I want to thank both of you for and really informative presentation and all of the participants for your comments and completion of surveys, etc. cetera. Uh, the survey link for your feedback on the webinar series is posted in the chat and we very much will see you next month for the topic of governance and ecosystem restoration. Thanks everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.